Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless soccer star megan rapino says her injury in championship game proves there is no god psalm 14 1 the fool has said in his heart there is no god they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none who does good <laughs> yeah i thought about it a little bit i mean you know i'm not a religious person or anything <laughs> And if there was a God, like, this is proof that there isn't. It's <laughs> fucked up. Um, so, yeah, it just, <laughs> it's just <laughs> fucked up because, like, it's just six minutes in. <laughs> it's just so bad. Yes, you're good. No way. Um, I'm not a religious person or anything. And if there was a God, like, this is proof that there isn't. Recently, there has been a tremendous increase in mockers and scoffers that are attacking Christianity and the Bible in general. On two occasions, the Bible warns that the closer the coming of the Lord Jesus, the greater the mockers and scoffers will become. 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4 Knowing this first, the scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Jude 1, 17 and 18 But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. What is so significant in both 2 Peter 3 and Jude is, the prophets and apostles warned about mockers and scoffers. Apparently, the mockers and scoffers are a sure indicator we are living in the last days. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Feminist pastor mocks the Apostle Paul, calls God a liar, says Satan told the truth, and justifies abortion. People often ask me how I can be a feminist and a Christian. My response is that being a feminist Christian is the only way I can be a Christian. The author of 1 Timothy would certainly have considered feminist theologians and female clergy to be disobedient daughters of Eve. And there are a lot of Christians out there who would agree. And that's okay with me. The Word of God proclaims, Let a woman learn in silence, with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12 In the church, God assigns different roles to men and women. God, through the Apostle Paul, restricts women from serving in roles of teaching or having spiritual authority over men. This precludes women from serving as pastors over men, which definitely includes preaching to them, teaching them, and exercising spiritual authority over them. God has ordained that only men are to serve in positions of spiritual teaching authority in the church. This is not because men are necessarily better teachers or because women are inferior or less intelligent. It is simply the way God designed the church to function. The Bible is clear on the qualifications for being a pastor. He must not be greedy for money and have a good testimony to the unsaved as we read in 1 Timothy 3, 1-7. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop that must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. 
For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Notice that the Apostle Paul used the pronouns he and his, and that a bishop or pastor must be the husband of one wife, not the wife of one husband. Scripture clearly teaches that women cannot be pastors. Feminist theology has taught me how to reinterpret scripture in ways that are healing and life-giving. And I refuse to allow conservative Christians or anyone else to take my God away from me. As a feminist theologian, one of the things that gives me joy is reinterpreting texts that have been used to hurt or control people. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith and false teachers would rise up as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Because the God that I know is full of light and life, because the God that I know holds me in my grief and walks with me in my pain, I know that the sacred word of God is not a weapon, nor should it ever be used to harm or shame people. Despite two millennia of misogynistic interpretations of Genesis and Eve, there have always been other ways to read this story. I love the story of Eve in the garden. My second child is named Eve. When we look at it with fresh eyes, it's quite a remarkable story. Have you ever noticed that God lied to Adam and Eve? While the serpent plays the role of the foil here, he's meant to set Eve up for her role as the bringer of wisdom and moral agency to the human community. The setup for this action that she takes is that God lied to her. Titus 1, 1 and 2. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. God told the first couple, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you will die. And the serpent reveals the truth. You won't die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This false teacher tells us that God is a liar, yet the serpent, who is Satan, tells the truth. Scripture plainly states that God cannot lie, and that Satan is the father of lies. John 8.44 You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And here we get to the real heart of the story, the verse in which Eve acts on behalf of all humanity. In fact, the moment at which Eve not only exercises her own moral agency, but she chooses that very trait that defines our humanity, that knowledge that makes us moral creatures, our ability to know good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. 
When we say that we need to trust women to make the critically important decision about whether to continue a pregnancy, it is rooted in a reinterpreted understanding of the story of the Garden of Eden that recognizes and affirms the moral agency and wisdom that Eve chose in the garden for all of us. The story of Eve is the story of why humanity is able to distinguish between what is right and wrong. And it marks this moral agency, this knowledge, as part of what it means to be made in the image of God. Reinterpreting Eve's actions as the origins of one of humanity's deepest connections with the divine helps us recognize the importance of respecting and supporting the moral agency of women. Across the country, politicians and judges are acting to force the disobedient daughters of Eve to bear children, rejecting our moral agency, imposing state control over our bodies and our childbearing. The problem lies not with the daughters of Eve, but with those who seek to use the tools of the state to police morality and codify a minority religious belief as law of the land. The fault lies not with Eve or her daughters. It never has. Now we can understand why this false teacher calls God a liar and twists scripture. This so-called sermon was about pro-choice. There's a correlation between child sacrifice in the Old Testament and modern day abortion. The Bible contains the heartbreaking tale of child sacrifice practiced in the name of Molech, a god of the Ammonites. Molech worship was practiced by the Ammonites and Canaanites, who revered Molech as a protecting father figure. Images of Molech were made of bronze, and their outstretched arms were heated and red hot. Living children were then placed into the idol's hands and died there, or were rolled into a fire pit below. God gave the people of Israel a dire warning concerning child sacrifice and Molech worship, as we read in Leviticus 20 verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, ye shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Sadly, King Solomon became involved in this horrendous practice, as recorded in 1 Kings 11, 6-8. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives, who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Later, the evil king Manasseh, offered his own son as a sacrifice, as did King Ahaz. The people of Judah also participated in this crime against their own sons, a sin so detestable that God said it had never even crossed his mind, as we read in Jeremiah 32:35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. In modern society, unprecedented numbers of children have been sacrificed at the hands of abortionists for the sake of convenience, immorality, and pride. Millions of babies have been sacrificed so that their parents can maintain a certain lifestyle. God hates hands that shed innocent blood, and we can be sure that God will judge this horrendous sin. There is good news for anyone who has had an abortion, and that is that God offers forgiveness to anyone who confesses their sins, as we read in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are so many signs that tell us we are living in the last days of Earth's history. The Apostle Paul's description of the last days prove it. One of the descriptions of society that Paul gave us to look for in the last days is that men would be lovers of themselves as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, 
haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. The internet's always been a weird place, but it's getting weirder. Now we have pig woman who roll in the mud for fun. My boyfriend just got home. Do you think I'm beautiful? Yes, I do. So beautiful. Pig woman cracked the code. I mean, the weirder you are, the more clicks you get. The more clicks you get, the more followers you get. The more followers you get, the more money you make. We're incentivizing psychotic behavior. I hope that was peanut butter. I have a feeling this can't be good. I feel dumber just by watching that. And the few sane people are now wondering, was it, where did we go wrong? Joining us now, cynical psychologist, Dr. Katherine Coleman. Um, I think everyone's gonna die. Well, we all will one day, that's true. From this, <laughs> Catherine, from this. Someone is going to die. And I'm gonna watch them die. And, and, and I don't know what to do with us. And by us, I mean people. Well, you know, I think Al Gore is to blame here because he invented the internet, right? I mean, <laughs> if, like you said before, if the internet didn't exist, we wouldn't be having these, you know, so-called influencers making these videos and getting clicks and making more money. It's like the weirder you get, the more attention you get. Every time I look on my phone, this stuff comes in my face. My algorithm is terrible. <laughs> Because all I see is women in the mud with pig faces and women in peanut butter baths and fat guys dancing on candy. What is this doing to anybody that opens up their phone and sees this? What can we do to well, protect us? You know, us? my concern is like, you know, teenagers and youth that are seeing this kind of behavior and thinking, hey, I can get attention if I put out videos like this too. You know, it, sometimes I, I look at myself and I think, oh man, why did I go to college for 10 years? to get a doctorate when I could have just made funny videos online. And I, and I worry that that's what we're teaching younger generations is that we can just throw away trade, we can throw away school and education. There's gonna be easier ways to make money and we're gonna see this, the absolute downfall of society. I think everyone's gonna die. Well, we all will one day, that's true. When you die, are you going to heaven or hell? And what does the Bible say about heaven and hell? Hell is a fiery furnace, Matthew 13, 41 through 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of outer darkness, sorrow, and pain, Matthew 22, 13. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is eternal. Matthew 25, 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Hell is a place of torment. Luke 16, 24 through 26. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime, you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted, and you are tormented. Hell is a place of separation. Luke 16.26 And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. The Bible speaks of the reality of hell in the same terms as the reality of heaven. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, 1 and 2 Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In fact, Jesus spent more time warning people about the dangers of hell than he did in comforting them with the hope of heaven. The concept of a real, conscious, 
forever and ever existence in hell is just as biblical as a real conscious forever and ever existence in heaven. Trying to separate them is simply not possible from a biblical standpoint. The good news is, no one has to go to hell. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.